Post was a civil rights activist in the struggle against discrimination and social injustice in Kentucky. She was born to Morris and Betty Kling in Louisville, Kentucky on March 19, 1933. Susie Post's long career in community activism stemmed from her German Jewish roots. Growing up in Louisville during World War II, she was aware that she had extended family trapped inside Nazi Germany. According to her son, Ben Post, she was shocked by the newsreel videos of the concentration camps she saw in local theaters. That was like a really, really big and compelling influence on her. The lessons of history and the oppression of minorities, Ben said. She joined a student branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People while a student at Indiana University and continued her student activism at the University of California, Berkeley. In her long career, she advocated for social justice and led the way in the battle for civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, and equity in housing and education. Her uncle, Arthur Kling, helped found the Kentucky Civil Liberties Union in 1955 and served on the board of the Louisville Urban League. Post was a social justice advocate since the 1950s when the civil rights movement was first organized in Louisville. Sit-ins at segregated businesses were followed by the open housing movement, which challenged the cultural norms in real estate transactions that kept homeowners separated by race and religion. In 1969, Post became president of the Kentucky Civil Liberties Union, later the American Civil Liberties Union of Kentucky. The KCLU provided legal representation for those arrested at many open housing marches, and Post worked with others to raise bail before an open housing law was finally adopted. While president of the KCLU, Post organized the first statewide women's conference and served as chair of the Kentucky Pro-Equal Rights Amendment Alliance. Representatives came from a cross-section of Louisville's social justice community, and Mayor Harvey Sloan afterwards provided the Louisville Jefferson County Human Relations Commission with funds to hire staff to monitor discrimination against women. Post worked for the local commission for eight years. By 1972, the KCLU and the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights both filed a school desegregation lawsuit against the Louisville Jefferson County Board of Education, which led to a controversial busing plan in 1975. As a white mother of five children in public schools at that time, Post was selected to be the best candidate to serve as the plaintiff. By 1975, the court ordered desegregation policy for the Jefferson County public school system was one of the first in the country. Post also monitored the educational institution's compliance with Title IX, prohibiting sex discrimination in education. When she was elected to the National American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, Board of Directors, she organized a women's caucus to improve the status of women on the national board and directed the strategy planning in 1972, whereby the National ACLU made women's rights its top priority. As part of the 1960s and 70s anti-war movement in Louisville, made famous by the nation's best known dissident, Muhammad Ali, Susie Post mentored and sheltered soldiers going AWOL, draft protesters, and other youth who opposed the war in Vietnam. As the chair of the KCLU, she worked to protect the rights of the protesters, but also at times, along with other activists like Anne and Carl Braden, broke the law personally by hiding soldiers fleeing from nearby Fort Knox. Providing space for meetings and access to printing machines, the Bradens and Post served as a sort of underground railroad for Kentuckians seeking to avoid military service in Vietnam. After leaving the Human Relations Commission in 1982, Post became the director of KCLU. She stayed there until 1990 when she accepted a job as founding director of the Metropolitan Housing Coalition, MHC, where she organized a fair housing committee to monitor local compliance with fair housing law. She resigned from MHC in 2002. 
Susie received numerous awards from many state and local organizations. She remained a member of the NAACP, the ACLU of Kentucky, and the Kentucky Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Susie Post died on January 2nd, 2019, at her home in Louisville. Now, in Susie Post's honor, we will explore three topics that were very important to her locally. The desegregation of JCPS schools, Title IX, and affordable housing. As I said before, Susie was instrumental in the 1975 court order that desegregated JCPS schools. Before desegregated schools, Black children were at a severe disadvantage. Central High School was the African-American high school. It's where Dr. Lyman Johnson taught. When the school desegregation lawsuit was brought, Central High School's auditorium, half the seats in the chairs were missing. The windows were broken. I mean, they were broken. There was a dusty playground, didn't have a tree on it. As soon as that school desegregation went into effect, many years after the lawsuit was filed, because the local judge kept, you know, declaring it inappropriate and sending it back to the Federal Court of Appeals. As soon as it became obvious that school was going to begin on such and such a date, they put new windows in Central, they put seats in the, they fixed the auditorium, and they planted trees out on the playground. That's why we desegregated. After the 1975 law was passed, suddenly black teachers and students were faced with drastic changes. Schools had to be between 15 to 50% black. With this decision came the new busing protocols, which are still controversial. Black kids were to be bused for up to 10 years of their schooling as opposed to white children being bused for two years. The Kentucky National Guard was called in to protect black students on the buses. While the ruling was made to support more equitable educational resources for black students and teachers, it was not implemented well initially, which Susie affirmed. Since Brown v. Board of Education, there were those who thought that, oh, a revolution. Well, nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened. And I just don't think we ever, 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 as a community, stood up and said, all right, we're going to have desegregated education. Integration is going to mean this, 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 and this. And we're watching you, Board of Education. There are certain things we expect of you. I, in retrospect, I don't think we prepared. I think we filed the suit. We thought that everything would fall into place. We didn't do what we should have done to make sure that things were going to fall in the right place. Title IX was passed in 1972 and was a monumental step forward for women's rights. Prior to Title IX, women were hardly allowed to participate in sports. This dates all the way back to Aristotle, who thought that women's reproductive systems were athletic liabilities and that if they played sports, they would become infertile. What? It wasn't until the late 1800s that women were even allowed to participate in recreational sports, but only the upper class. By 1970, only 7% of high school athletes and 15% of college athletes were women. And women's sports were highly underfunded. Finally, in 1975, Title IX regulations were enacted. Because of this law, the number of women in high school and collegiate sports rocketed from less than 300,000 to more than 2.6 million. I knew about Title IX because I was a member of the National Organization for Women. And they had run a project in which they encouraged monitoring of the local schools to see if it was in compliance. 
And so I flew up to Washington where their office was and I met with them and they gave me samples of every questionnaire they had to do a Title IX monitoring program. And Title IX is a law that says all, any educational institution that receives federal financial assistance, which is most of them, may not discriminate on the basis of gender. Thereby, you can't have girls without, you can't have boys playing soccer and no girls playing soccer. You can't have boys playing football with no equivalent. You can't have boys being ch uh, channeled to higher math and girls channeled away from it. You can't do that, that's illegal. Amani Williams, former Kentucky State University basketball player and current assistant coach, talks about how Title IX has personally affected her. I think about it, I think about like how many barriers people have broke for me to be able to get here. And I start to think about what barriers can I break for the next person or for the next woman or for the next black girl that's growing up. Jackie Duval, associate athletic director, is also amazed by the effects. Kind of bittersweet because it's like, wow, only 50 years that we that we've been doing this and that we've been, um, you know, in a position in which we're not supposed to be discriminated against. We have to be able to push forward, and I think we should be doing that more of just supporting each other, you know, encouraging each other, and just being there for each other. And that just makes a whole difference in just empowering Black women to be more successful in the real world. There is still work to be done, however. Just this year, a group of women filed a Title IX lawsuit against University of Kentucky for inequitable spending on women's sports. Let's look now at the average pay for those head coaches. The average for a UK head men's team coach was just over $2 million. That's the fifth highest in the SEC. Meanwhile, the average for a UK women's team head coach was just under a quarter of a million. Kentucky ranks near the bottom. That's 12th out of 14 for women's head coach pay. What? Affordable housing, particularly for African Americans, was a major issue for Susie. She started working for an open housing ordinance in 1966. As a concerned citizen, she persuaded community groups like the League of Women Voters and the National Council for Jewish Women to join the cause. It was a radical concept, she said of the ordinance. And the Fair Housing Campaign was an effort to secure for all residents of Jefferson County, the right to own a home without discrimination. Following her tenure as executive director of the Kentucky Civil Liberties Union, Post in 1990 became the director of the Metropolitan Housing Coalition, which advocates for affordable housing. She resigned from there in 2002. But what is affordable housing? This is how Amy Shear, local Jewish social justice activist and mentee of Susie Post defines it. A commonly accepted guideline for housing affordability is a housing cost, including utilities, that does not exceed 30% of a household's gross income. Per Louisville's housing needs assessment in 2019, Louisville was short 58,341 affordable housing units. Since the pandemic, the number has very likely gone up. Several organizations in Louisville are working to create more affordable housing, such as the Metropolitan Housing Coalition, the Housing Partnership, Rebound Inc., New Directions Housing Corporation, and the Louisville Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Mayor Craig Greenberg has stated a goal of building 15,000 affordable housing units within his first term. Many find this unlikely, considering fewer than 9,000 affordable housing units received public subsidies during the previous administration's 12 years in office. Susie's activism also took a toll on her personally. As she fought tirelessly in the community, some of her children felt neglected while they were growing up. She also divorced her husband, Edward. 
Additionally, her work angered those on the right and the left. For example, State Representative Jean Huff of London, an ordained Pentecostal minister, denounced the KCLU for defending anarchists and homosexuals. Additionally, she and the KCLU were committed to defending the rights of free expression, even when it applied to groups that ran counter to her values of equity and justice. Susie and the KCLU were criticized by left-leaning individuals for defending the Ku Klux Klan's right to distribute literature on roadways and for defending a police officer's refusal to disclose fellow Klan members in the department. Her son Ben said that she understood that there would be dangerous consequences to infringing on the KKK's freedom of speech. According to Ben, Susie and the KCLU were not defending the ideas of the Ku Klux Klan, they were defending the rights of free speech. As you see, with just the three issues we highlighted, the work is never done. But we as Jews and human beings are called upon to be just and righteous. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Indeed, Judaism sees the maintenance of justice and equity as part of humanity's universal obligations. The Hebrew Bible's vision of social justice flows from its teaching regarding the sanctity of all human life and its inalienable dignity. Additionally, Pirkei Avot, or the Ethics of the Fathers, states, You are not required to finish your work, yet neither are you permitted to desist from it. And here is Susie in her own voice encouraging us to act. So we're talking about a variety of things, and then she popped up with, Susie, what makes you do what you do? And without even giving it a thought, I said, injustice, it just pisses me off. And that's, that's why I do what I do. It just pisses me off. I had more comments from my female friends about the Courier-Journal letting that word see print and the photograph that was taken of me. Ooh, that was a really flattering photograph. And they let you say piss. <laughs> I mean, I think you, I think you missed the nub, girls. Mm -hmm. But that's true. That's just when you when you see injustice, it just if it doesn't piss you off, there's something the matter with your central nervous system. Thank you, Susie Post. We will never forget you. Mm -hmm.